はい、それでは、えー、時間となりましたのでセミナーを開始いたします。本日座長を務めますのは九州大学アジアオセアニア研究教育機構研究推進コーディネーターの横田文彦准教授です。横田先生よろしくお願いいたします。はい、リー先生ありがとうございます。えー、皆様こんにちは、えー。先ほどご紹介いただきました横田文彦と申します。えー、本日は講演者のクロンツ先生が。えー、英語でご発表されますので、英語でお願いできればと思います。えー、日本語の同時通訳が、えー、Zoom の下にあございますので、えー、通訳機能をですね、クリックいたしますと、日本語を選択でお願いできればと思います。えー、また、日本語の講演スライドも、チャット内にある URL からダウンロード可能ですので、えー、ご活用いただければと思います。えー、それではよろしくお願いいたします。Hello everyone,、uh, welcome to b r a m b a c k seminar number 109. My name is Fumihiko Yokota, a chair for today's seminar.、Uh, today we are very pleased to welcome our guest speaker, uh, uh, Professor Charlo,、uh, Charlene k l o n t s e n s e i Associate Professor at Kyushu University Faculty of Humanities. Today her presentation title is Enacting the World. A cognitive science from mindfulness to intermediate poetry. She will be talking about mindfulness lifestyle in relation with contemporary French poetry combined with art. Today, <coughs> excuse me, sorry,、uh, I'm very grateful for having Dr. Kron Sensei, who has expertise not only in French poetry, but also in yoga. Uh, meditation and other mindfulness activities. Today will be a wonderful opportunity for us to learn about what is mindfulness and how its relationship with poetry and art from her experience. So please take a look at、uh, Kron Sensei's profile slide on the screen. So, Dr. k r o n t Sensei earned her PhD in French language and literature at Pau University in France in 2016. The same year, while continuing her work for the French Ministry of Education, she became an associate researcher for Pau University until 2008 18, when she got a position at Kyushu University Faculty of Humanities as a visiting professor. In 2019, she became a lecturer at Kyushu University, and 2020, next year, she was promoted to associate professor. Her research has led to the notable book entitled, as you can see in this slide, The Glass Shim Luca Text,、uh, Text Image Sun Oxford, b a r n Peter Lang, published in 2020. Beyond her Academic achievement. She is a teacher for various t y p e of yoga,、uh, such as vinyasa, hatha, aerial yoga. She provides monthly yoga class in Fukuoka. Actually, I joined her yoga class last March, and since then, I became a big fan of her yoga class, and now、uh, I'm a, one of the regular participants at the, her yoga class. Kron Sensei's yoga style is very creative, enjoyable, and influential. Her yoga makes us feel not only relaxed and peace in mind, but also full of positive energy and love. So, today I hope you feel the same for this today's seminar. She also does zazen, suki, bouldering, running, swimming. Furthermore, furthermore, She ran her private online wellness studio with her husband, who can do Japanese acupuncture, Aikido, and the Japanese calligraphy. So now let us warmly welcome Dr. Kron Sensei to the stage, online stage. So, Kron Sensei, if we are ready, the stage is yours. <laughs> I am ready. Thank you so much, Professor Yokota, for your very, very kind introduction. And also, I'm always happy to have you joining my yoga classes. It's so great to have、uh, such a good yogi uh, in uh, this class. And also, I would like to acknowledge、uh, Lee Sensei's huge help for the Japanese、uh, translations of my slides and the poster. 
uh, I'm deeply uh, indebted. <laughs> and also I'm thankful to all the people involved in the organization of this conference uh, today. So let's start with the presentation. Maybe I would like to share some slides. If you give me a few seconds. And maybe you can see it now. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. So confirmed in the last decades by cognitive sciences, well, uh, mindfulness, wellness and intermedia poetry have a common ground in the way they link body and mind and in how they create a specific relation between uh, humanity and the world. This is the topic of my latest uh, research. In the last 10 years, uh, my work on performance and intermedia French speaking poetry took a new turn, especially in relation uh, to cognitive sciences, to the practice of yoga, and also uh, to finally the teaching uh, of mindfulness movement and meditation. I wouldn't be on this path today uh, without the influence of my yoga teachers, my wonderful yoga teachers, especially Park Heki Sensei, and also my Zazen uh, teacher, which is the venerable uh, Aikido Shihan Suganuma Morito. Uh, because since living in Japan, everything started to uh, come together. My lifestyle and my research are uh, nourishing each other. First of all, uh, I would like to play a little game with you. I know it's not <laughs> usual, but I would like to ask for your opinion on a very, very simple question. So if you would like to answer in the chat box as quickly as possible in English or in Japanese, there is no uh, good or no bad answer, of course, just your opinion on this. So let's start with this question, which is, which is not really a question you will see. We see we hear, we feel the beauty of the world and of us all in this same world. We see the beauty in each object of contemplation, whatever it is. We inhabit the world with intensity and we sustain an embodied presence. Is this poetry or is this mindfulness? What is your opinion on this? Please answer whatever feels right for you. If you have a few seconds, you can participate and give me this opinion. Well, maybe you all understood, of course, that these statements can all apply to uh, poetry and mindfulness, of course. Thank you for uh, participating in this little uh, game. Uh, but maybe we shall first define what is mindfulness and what is intermediate poetry with a few basic definitions. So first of all, what is mindfulness? I would start by quoting um, uh, researchers in neurosciences and biology, Varela, Thompson and Roche, uh, who wrote in the book The Embodied Mind, um, which is a lot about um, mindfulness. Um, the mind is present in embodied everyday experience. This is mindfulness. The mindfulness techniques lead uh, the mind back from its theories and preoccupations, back from the abstract uh, attitude to the situation of one's experience itself. They help people to keep a quiet mind uh, when facing, for example, difficulties in personal or interpersonal relationships, which can then lead to uh, building another type of community. Second definition, intermediate poetry. So what is intermediate poetry? In fact, it's really simple. It's a form of uh, modern and contemporary poetry, especially from the 20th uh, and 21st century, uh, that uses different types of mediations blending several arts and multi-sensual uh, collaborations. My research focuses on uh, the examination of the embodied experience. That's what I wanted to talk uh, about today, both for the poet and the artist, with the reader and the spectator. So it's a shared experience. Experience that is created in order to have another understanding of the world and of how we relate to it. 
So if the link was not clear enough, one can relate to the most recent examples of art therapy. It helps the patient to express his or her uh, state of mind, to find uh, relief and to thrust the body in the healing process. These practices, of course, have a very long history. So I would like to uh, show you here just a few examples from Asia uh, on display right now uh, in Paris for the special exhibition um, Healing Practices. It's a translation of the title, Healing Practices from Asia, the Art of uh, Balance. The first example on the left uh, uh, side of the slide comes from the traditions of uh, Sri Lanka, where the therapeutic practices are a way to redirect the attitude of the local spectators towards uh, the patient in order for the patient to readjust his or her perspective on the disease. That means that the group, the ritual uh, are really important in relation to the patient for him or her to understand what is happening in his mind or in his body. So in that case, artistic uh, practice, global healthcare, and the community relationships are essential in order for the ritual to be efficient. The second example on the right side of the slide uh, comes from Korean traditional health practices. The healer used an elaborate ritualistic system from which the patient could acknowledge his or her problems. Once it was expressed, the patient felt relieved from the pain to a certain degree, of course, and could also regain a quiet mind. The healer also helped with what is called nowadays uh, in uh, psychology, transgenerational trauma. The healer allows the family to treat their relation with their past and their ancestors. Healers from old times, as we just saw, are not, separated, uh, are not separating the cure of the body, the cure of the mind, and also a wider poetical and spiritual aspect which we could relate nowadays, of course, with uh, uh, new medicine uh, to the interactions of humans with their environment. Even if it's a bit uh, limited, we often say that the creating process also is a way to clear up the turmoil of the mind. And there is a very uh, famous um, Japanese uh, Zen calligraphy proverb that says, Hei Jyo Shin, uh, to keep a quiet mind, a heart, uh, in any circumstance. A lot of writers also argue that writing is vital. I insist on the word vital, like life force, uh, vital for them. Mindfulness also is a way to heal through the contemplation of the world and of our uh, own interiority in order to reach uh, a certain freedom. Mindfulness has roots in uh, the oldest practices of India and of the Buddhist uh, cultures. But in the United States, one of the pioneers of mindfulness is uh, the well-known uh, Dr. John Kabat-Zinn, who founded in 1979 what would be called later um, the Center for Mindfulness in Medicine, Health, uh, care and society uh, at the uh, University of Massachusetts. And in Europe, in France especially, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, the exiled uh, Buddhist monk, um, left Vietnam in 1966 and settled in France in 1970, um, no, settled in France in 1966 and created in 1975 uh, the Sweet Potatoes Meditation Center near the city of Troyes. And later on, in 1982, uh, founded the Plum Village uh, Monastery near the city of Bordeaux. It's more in the rural um, region, but cle clearly near Bordeaux. So in uh, 1982, the Plum Village Monastery. And Thich Nhat Hanh has had also a, wor a worldwide impact too for the mindfulness uh, spreading. In the mindfulness lifestyle, which can also be a secular uh, practice like mine or like uh, Dr. John kabat uh, practice, the psychological aspects have an important role in the transformation of the practitioner's life. 
practitioners can reach a state of flow and a deep connection to their core happiness. You learn how to let go because the more you grasp onto something, the more it seems fleeting. You learn how to turn off the automatic mode of the hamster's wheel, always, always going on like this. In the 90s, um, Mihaly Shikzen Mihaly, which is a researcher in philosophy uh, from uh, Central Europe, and his team at the University of Chicago developed a theory of, I quote, the optimal experience based on the concept of flow, the state in which people are so involved in an activity that nothing else seems to matter. The state of flow uh, relies on physical and sensory skills. And what is more important for our, our matter today too is on symbolic skills. You can see it here. You can also see some effects of the state of flow. For example, in yoga, Aikido, meditation, uh, Zen calligraphy, and intermediate poetry in some cases, of course, uh, both uh, types of skills are combined. Additionally, when the workplace allows uh, workers to reach this state of flow, it is guaranteed that they will be focused because they enjoy it at a core level. In order to reach that state, one of the components of the state of flow is, I quote Chikzen Mihaly, to join all experience into a meaningful pattern, a meaningful pattern, all experience. Uh, since the COVID crisis, Regardless of their social background, uh, one can see nowadays people from all over the world quitting their job because they cannot seem to find uh, any deep meaning anymore. Um, in French, we refer to this reality as the loss of a purpose. It is clear that these people could not find rewards in the ongoing stream of experience. With mindfulness techniques, one has the power in his or her hands and not into the hands of others. Indeed, Shikzen Mihaly writes that as long as we obey the socially conditioned stimulus response patterns that exploit our biological inclinations, we are controlled from the outside to the extent that a glamorous ad makes us salivate for the product sold or that a frown from the boss spoils the day and this is an interesting uh, quotation i think the more people experience a state of flow thanks to an alternative organization of consciousness the more their quality of life is improved whether it is through movement meditation artistic or literary practices the flow helps to integrate the self because in that state of deep concentration, consciousness is unusually well ordered. I quote Chikzen Mihaly, of course, thoughts, intentions, feelings, and all the senses are focused on the same goal. When the flow episode is over, it is not a, an infinite continuous uh, state of flow, of course, it's several little um, regular um, state of flow. And especially if you practice uh, mindfulness, for example, or yoga or Aikido, you, you can feel this state of flow uh, lasting longer and longer in your life. And this is beautiful, I think. So let's come back to Shikzen Mihaly. So he says that when the episode flow is over, one feels more together than before, not only internally, but also with respect to other people and to the world in general. People create a more balanced life bonding that Shikzen Mihaly calls, uh, I wrote it here on the slide, differentiation and integration, and which helps to find a harmonious life um, that grows and that is not a egotism, even if I wrote in the word individ uh, individuality, that is not an egotism. And that is not a lack of autonomy, even though I wrote the word unity. Mindfulness is thus a restorative homeostatic experience. What does it mean? It means 
an experience that regulates your body and your mind for your own benefits. Uh, to put it in simple words, it's as if you were turning on and off the, the heater button, in fact, you adjust. Individual as well as collective, this experience generates wellness, but also infinite cycloid relationships with what I called the outside world. Let's keep this expression for now. <laughs> we often feel separated from the outside world. There is a me or, or you and the outside world. But really, who are you? <laughs> this is a question raised by the poet and artist Gerasim Luca, which I will talk later on about. For him, there is no real identity, like uh, the administrative identity or the passport identity. For him, it's not a real identity because it's fluctuant. Um, it is complex. It is multiple on a genetic level, on a mental, on a physical level, on a feeling level, and so on. It is really complex, more complex than that. And also, you bear in your digestive system a multitude of bacteria, which is life itself. <laughs> yes, it is. And that you need in order to survive and that were brought by uh, the environment in which you grew up. On the contrary of what we thought even a few decades ago, human life is not based on a linear input uh, output mode, as you can see on the left side of the slide. This is what the researchers thought at the beginning, very beginning uh, of uh, the age of the AIs, the AI. The first AI was mainly based on an input output execution, but the human approach of developing and living is far more complicated than that and intricates body and mind. That's why the first AI did not function exactly the same way the actual, the present AI, like ChatGPT, do now, thanks to the learning process. Even if we cannot say for now that the AI is really exactly similar to the human system because it still needs a programmer that creates its frontiers and its way of uh, functioning. But it's still really important for what uh, we are saying today. What happened between these two states of research or these two states of uh, the AI, for example? The researchers found that that the human cognitive mechanisms were a sum of continuous processes between the environment, the others, and a particular individual. In fact, we shouldn't talk about an outside world. That's why I wrote this provocative uh, title, To Be or Not To Be. Uh, because outside world means the world is separated from me. And we know that a human mind and body links proprioception, which is how your body is feeling um, uh, knowing the body's uh, position in an environment. And this is really important for yoga, Aikido, for example, or a dance or any other uh, art practice uh, with the stage and movement and body or for your own everyday life. So body and mind links proprioception and interoception which is how your body is feeling from the inside, not as a, a researcher analyzing something. No, no, no. Just a knowing intuitively. You, you know it from your uh, inside. Indeed, you are part of the same uh, world that changes you throughout your whole life, as you can see on the right uh, side of the slide, with food, nature, social rules, events, interactions and so on, and who you also transform by your own presence through your actions, your feelings, uh, your relationships, your creations, for example. When you see the world from this perspective, it feels there is um, more hope in your life in order uh, to change the world for the best, of course, at your own level. It is also from this perspective that beauty emerges. These infinite and dynamic cycloid relationships that we have with others and with the environment often have to do with aesthetics in the form of uh, sound, image, or uh, word, uh, visual visualization, for example. Poems and awareness are not a fixed uh, state. 
It is a dynamic that reaches to others and to the world. It is a way to be and to see beauty and also to uh, include yourself in this. Being mindful, aware and creative uh, is a way to modify your state of consciousness, but it also modifies the state of consciousness of the others around you. Little question again, you can answer in the chat box. Have you ever felt taken away by something you were reading? Have you ever felt taken away by a performance you were watching? Um, also, have you felt that it was as real as reality? I did, and I hope you did too. So thank you for answering. This modified state of consciousness is not only imagination. I've been often uh, told, well, uh, poetry, uh, mindfulness, uh, visualization, meditation, it's only imagination, you know, it's not real life. Okay. <laughs> I uh, agree to disagree. <laughs> it is life itself and the expression of the possibilities offered to us all. Being aware and being an artist is not an entertainment to forget the outside world. It is being totally present in each moment of your life. Whereas after reading, after a mindfulness practice or participating in a performance or maybe in a conference, I hope so, you are modified and you have another view on the world that might lead you to react or act better differently. Each new gathering is unique. The participants, uh, the moment, the conditions, the feelings, the interactions. And you can also find this idea in a Japanese Zen proverb that says um, Ichigo Ichie, which is a once in a lifetime encounter that you can uh, often find uh, linked to tea ceremony. The modified state of consciousness that is produced is only possible in the present time when body and mind are in harmony. Even though practiced at different levels, of course, not everyone becomes a huge artist or not everyone becomes a, a, a venerable um, a sensei uh, well known in the mountains of Himalaya or of course not, we are all doing this at our own level, but this is fine too this is perfect too so even though practiced at different levels awareness and creativity are not a gift that you received at your birth it is a training of the mind and the body it is a training that's why the tea ceremony i was talking about earlier is first of all a learning process of the forms also in french the word poetry etymologically comes from the ancient greek word Poyen, which means to do, which is related to artisanal processes. Also, the word poetics etymologically means the study of the forms. It does not, it does not mean that the researcher in the field, um, in the field of poetics, like me, for example, um, only describes and classify the forms. This is, this is not my, my job exactly. <laughs> On the contrary, studying the poetics is always done in relation to the mind and to the deep meaning intertwined with the mediation of the form. If form and meaning stay in contact, like body and mind, it reminds me of um, an, a beautiful image that we can find in koan, uh, Zen koan, Zen, Zen philosophical uh, stories um, about the vase. The, the vase can only work if you have a hole in it, if you have emptiness in it. So the pottery is, is perfect, but you need the, also the emptiness. So it is similar to the vase and its necessary emptiness. This is also one of the potential interpretation of the Zen um, proverb from the Heart Sutra, which is emptiness is form, form is emptiness. I think it's uh, maybe enlightening for our matter today. This question had also been raised to some extent, of course, not in the same um, a way exactly, but to some extent by the philosophers of the ancient Greek. The gymnasium was a place where the people could practice uh, sports, wash themselves and bath, and then debate or discuss philosophical uh, questions. 
such as in uh, Plato Academia in the fifth, uh, fourth uh, to fifth uh, before Christ, and in Aristoteles uh, Lyceum, uh, fourth before Christ. It's not exactly exactly the same as uh, yoga, of course, but you can find links like uh, physical uh, exercise uh, linked with uh, philosophical thinking. During the time period in between the Mediterranean antiquity and our contemporary world, the Cartesian thought had nevertheless specified that there could be a world out there. The Cartesian thought um, um, thinks or says that the world out there is independent from us, um, which we are only representing or maybe, maybe dreaming. And culturally speaking, French thought, French education or French research uh, are deeply grounded, uh, grounded on the cat's approach of life. Of course, it evolved a lot uh, since then, but still. And one of the main legacies of the French philosopher and scientist from the 17th century is the book called uh, Metaphysical Meditations, in which, in which he puts into question the point of view of the dominant Christianity before um, Enlightenment and the French uh, Revolution, which is an interesting way to put forward uh, critical thinking at the time. He states that the only thing we know for sure is that we are rational beings. He says, I think therefore I am, cogito ergo sum. It's a way to interrogate the foundation of the philosophical thinking. What can we be sure of? Descartes' thought stands at the foundation of a long tradition of Western philosophers and had, of course, been put into question uh, during the, uh, the 20th century, for example, or since then. But Descartes uh, raises interesting questions that should not be left aside. The problem is that because of that, the relationship between humans and the environment has often been understood as a representational relation. Let me explain a little. In this system, the word, world out there is living its own life. We humans are barely absorbing, absorbing like this, the world in our mind, in our body, through our senses and organs. The processes of the representation of the world uh, looks like, in that case, as the mechanism of a camera, for example. So it's really mechanistic. It's a one side process where humanity is barely a machine with an input and an output. But the scientists Varela, Thomson, Roche and Maturana showed that cognitive sciences in the 90s were not yet taking seriously into account the embodied aspect of human life. Their theory is known as the inaction approach on which I base my most recent uh, research work. They write that, I quote, cognition is not the representation of a pre-given world by a pre-given mind, but is rather the enactment of a world and a mind on the basis of a history of actions that a being in the world performs. With the example of the Francophone work of Gerasim Luca, we will see how intermediate poetry creates a multi-central experience that allows interactions and transformations, and thus that enacts the world. So in Romania, Gerasim Luca founded with his friend in Bucharest, uh, the Surrealist uh, group, the Bucharest, uh, Bucharestian uh, Surrealist group in the, um, uh, in the beginning of the, the first half of the 20th century. Uh, but because of the communist regime, he had to flee um, to, from Romania, to flew from Romania, and he left in uh, the 50s through Israel and settled in Paris in 1952. And then uh, arriving in Paris, he just quit uh, surreal surrealism to be even more free uh, than before. Um, he was also uh, giving a lot of uh, stage performance, uh, like. Um, he started in the 60s um, with what he called recitals. And recitals, uh, you use this term also in music, so you can see how arts are intertwined. Uh, he was working with artists, uh, sculptures, uh, photographs, uh, scientists, and so on, uh, with uh, several uh, materials and uh, places. And we don't have much time, but we can talk about 
these examples later if uh, you want of art uh, practices. So you can see anyway that the artistic di disciplines are intertwined. It's not only poetry in a book uh, with some words in a book. It's also uh, more, uh, it's wider than this. Uh, the public um, was not passive, uh, but involved at different degrees into uh, the processes of the work of art. The multiplicity of the work of art is linked to the poet's idea of a multiplicity of the self. The mindfulness practices um, helps, for example, to see that uh, the best way to cope with our impermanence is to live fully in the presence, in the present. Uh, like in the theories of the cognitivism, the poet uh, shows that the self is fragmented, never stable. You can see it on the slide here with Kubomania. You can see how the self is fragmented. The poet considers that there is no unified and never changing self. And thus, it contradicts the Cartesian conception that leaves aside the experiential nature of this self, the processes of the thought while in action, and the relations lived with the body. If there is a self, Luca rather underlines its constant changes and its multiple forms. This line of thought can also be found to some extent uh, in Henri Bergson's philosophical writing, who um, in 1907, in the book, uh, The Creative uh, Evolution, writes, is my personality one or multiple? To which he answers, I am a multiple unity <laughs> or a unique multiplicity. <laughs> Very interesting, I think. Luca also highlights this through artistic practices that show the human cognitive processes. In general, he wants to put the practical life and the experience, whatever it is, at the heart of the poetical writing and creation. After World War II, the first step of cognitivism only perceived the brain as a deductive machine. At that time, Luca's writing was trying to highlight another aspect of the human experience. He wanted to underline the variations of the human mind without trying to correct them, as you can see in several disciplines, nor uh, to class them, neither to class classify them. The performer wanted to show on stage during his recitals the words in action. They were the observation by the poet of the constant oscillations between the self and the non-self, the self and the world, the body and the mind, the void and the fullness. He had a global view on these interactions and fusions without excluding the contradictions because they are all part of life and can help us see the space in between and the articulations. Thus, his work is a lived and an experiential form of poetry, which means an embodied poetry. And I'm almost, I'm almost done. <laughs> But maybe we can also have a look to uh, the work Sisyphe Geometre from 1966. Uh, in this work, the poems deal with anxiety, which is a chronic problem in our industrialized societies. The text intertwined the word anguish and the words with the same etymological root with geometrical definition. In 
in the poems, the word anguish infiltrates the orthodox system of geometry, which is usually the classical structure of French art in the 17th century. People could interact with this piece of art. The spectator could make the tape play, stop, move, and maybe the person will live in the middle. Um, another spectator could then take the lead in this participative art. The poems are a trigger for reflection on what is anxiety and how it comes and goes in our mind. It also puts into question the idea of a mechanistic humanity. This example shows that what happens in the human mind, like anxiety or stress-related uh, reactions, is always in movement. Changing, stopping, starting all over again, interrupting, and so on. The outside world, and you know what I think about this expression, has an effect on the human mind, but they also constantly interact. And I will conclude that I'm sorry <laughs> for uh, making you wait. So to sum up, in a time where some people may think that literature, art, meditation, or mindful practices are not productive enough, I feel the need to insist on the fact that these practices are not only happening in our imagination. They are the grounding on which humans interact with the world, and thus they have a role in the creation of our present and future world. Yes, human is body and mind reunited. Both intermediate poetry and awareness enact the world. Because the embodied mind does not represent the world, the embodied mind transforms the world and is transformed in return, which is closer to a dynamic where outside and inside worlds are not divided. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay, yes, yes. Thank you so much. Yes, yes, yes. I think that did anybody um see the screen? Now it's okay. Can you hear us? Yes, okay, okay. Thank you very much, Sharon Sensei. Um it, I I um I really appreciate uh your beautiful presentation because you know we, we, we live in a, such a very busy busy life every day so you know it's really um gives me uh you know remind us to be more spend more time sometimes be aware appreciate uh, conscious about our inter our body and the mindfulness uh connected to the uh, beauty of the outside world so yeah it was very beautiful and the way you you present is very beautiful like a poetry so i really appreciate it. yeah the wonderful so much, but i don't know if i'm really a poet <laughs> yeah very nice um i wish i have you know that, that's that kind of a yeah beautiful presentation so um, I'm sorry, we, we don't have enough time for the questions and the answer, but if anyone on the audience who have a question and answer, please put it in the chat box. Um, so there are some uh, comment. Uh, thank you very much, Sharon Kron Sensei. Um, it was very engaging and uh, beautiful presentation. So lots of comment in the chat box. So yeah, um, I really, Really, uh, thanks for um, sharing senses today's opportunity and also who uh, joined uh, today's uh, BBS. So, um, uh, so hopefully uh, you will have a wonderful, wonderful day, wonderful rest of the day, uh, the presentation. And once again, thank you, Sharon Sensei, for, for today. Thank you, Yokota Sensei for this uh, invitation. Really, I'm really happy to be here today. I'm sorry for the length of uh, the presentation. <laughs> I'm talking too much. <laughs> but no, thank no. You so much. I'm sorry, we, I wish we have uh, more time. Uh, yes. But uh, uh, so I give it to Ali uh, Sensei uh, for, for the announcement. 
。あ、チャーリー先生、お願いします。Uh, thank you very much, and m e x i b o k Professor Clones, and Professor Yokota. Saigoni, Jimuko, j i m u k i a s e t e Itadakimas. Mazu, Jikai no, Dai, Hakujukai no, Brambak Seminar no, Guanai de Gozaimas. Jikai wa, Raishu, Kugats, Muika, Siobi, Juniji Jupun Yori, Kyushu Daigak, Carbon Neutral Energy, Koksai Kenki Jo no, Shaha, シャハビデユバラン教授よりカーボンニュートラルなエネルギー,エネルギー社会を実現する個体執着リサイクルサイクルと題し講演を実施いたします。詳細はホームページをご覧ください。